Uh, good afternoon. Um, obviously, uh, we were gathered here today for the governor to deliver an emergent message to the legislature as set forth and defined within the Constitution. And, uh, you know, not unbeknownst to any of us, that message had to do with the legislature's failure to agree with the governor on the issue of how we move forward in providing a tax reduction to the res residents of New Jersey. Uh, what you heard the governor challenge the legislature with today is to not rely on revenue collections, to not pay attention to the fact that his projected revenues for the balance of the fiscal year that just ended never met their targets. As we move into the 2013 fiscal year, no one in the country has projected the type of revenue realization that the state of New Jersey is in. We all remember, going back to the Whitman administration, when a 30 percent income tax reduction was effectuated. That is part of the difficulty that set us in this trajectory. This legislature has remained firm. We will work with the governor in a bipartisan fashion. We will address the issue of property tax reduction for residents in this state, but we will do it when we have the confidence that the revenue is there to support the cut and to sustain the cut over the course of the next several years. Now going to uh, uh, ask uh, Assemblyman Greenwall to uh, provide you with some commentary, because as you know, uh, in the Assembly, we never accepted or embraced the plan that the governor made reference to today. We focused on real property tax relief for residents. We have repeatedly said that the plan that the governor has put on the table is a plan that will give the average family in this state approximately $20 in 2013 when they file their taxes, and his plan was to phase in the reduction over the course of the next three to four years. At the end of that period, an average working class family in this state would realize a tax deduction of about $80 over the next three to four year period. Without revenue targets being stabilized, we will find ourselves in a situation where we will not have enough revenue to meet the dis divergent requirements that are placed upon us, some statutorily and others because they are priorities for us in New Jersey. The issue gets to be revenue, affordability, and the Democrats in the Assembly are more than willing to effectuate a plan, but not until we settle this issue of revenue. Uh, Majority Leader Greenwald. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, the question you really should ask yourself is what has changed in the last four days? And the truth of the matter is that nothing has changed in the last four days. New Jersey's unemployment rate is still at 9.2 percent, a full percentage point plus, more than the national average. Nothing has changed regarding New Jersey's ranking on our gross domestic product, ranking us 47th amongst the 50 states. The only thing that has truly changed in the last four days is that we heard word again that another company will leave the state and take 1,000 jobs with them. The governor talks about wanting to provide tax relief to people. He talks about a $600 million surplus that are revenues from his surplus. He achieved that by cutting property tax relief for families in the Democratic budget that he was presented. He cut tax relief by not providing the energy gross receipts tax. He provided tax relief by not funding the, the rebates, uh, as he has promised to do. And he continues to take that on the back of New Jersey residents. Democrats approved tripling the property tax relief funding and helping middle class and seniors under the Homestead Benefit Program. Governor Christie vetoed it. Democrats approved fully funding suburban and rural school aid. Governor Christie vetoed it. Democrats approved boosting property tax relief for senior citizens. Governor Christie vetoed it. Democrats approved income tax relief for working poor families. Governor Christie vetoed it. Democrats approved legislation to help low-income New Jerseyans needing legal services. Governor Christie vetoed it. Democrats approved helping women obtain quality health care. Governor Christie vetoed it. 
Time and time again, Governor Christie has failed when it comes to tax relief and helping New Jersey's working families. In fact, New Jerseyans have endured that net 20 percent property tax increase on money out of their pocket because the governor has failed on his commitment to provide true tax relief. The only consistency Governor Christie shows is his devotion to protecting the mega, the mega rich and the wealthy. New Jerseyans deserve better than this manic zeal to protect tax cuts for this mega rich population. The governor has said that the Democratic legislature increased taxes by $800 million on New Jersey families. Governor Christie and his wife filed tax returns somewhere between $600,000 and $750,000. And if you were to ask Governor Christie, would he pay more under the Democratic plan, the answer to that question would be no. And if Governor Christie's family, in the wealthiest 1 percent in this state, would not pay a penny more in income tax, it's safe to say that the other 99 percent of New Jersey families would not either. But they would receive a benefit of up to 20 percent in property tax relief. Ladies and gentlemen, the governor talks today about embracing uh, the plan from the legislature that was originally crafted by those of us in the assembly. The difference between our plan and the plan that the governor embraces is that the governor embraces a plan that would provide, as the speaker said, somewhere around 20 to $106 this year in tax relief. The average property taxpayer pays $7,700 a year. The plan that we introduced is one that paid for itself, put over a billion dollars in real relief in the people's pockets, and would have provided for seniors and the disabled up to 20 percent property tax relief, 2,000 to 2,500 dollars in property tax relief, 106 dollars versus 2,000 to 2,500. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to stimulate our economy, put the hands in the people, the public who are struggling the most. The governor likes to talk about bipartisanship when he's outside of the state. He talks about tenure reform. He talks about pension and health reform. He talks about the most recent success around higher ed reform. The people standing at this podium made those a reality because the plans that were originally presented by the governor were dead on arrival. And the people around this podium are the ones who drove the compromise to make a difference. If the governor really wanted to have a discussion, and I can tell you standing here, and every one of these members will verify, the governor says we did not negotiate with him on a budget. He has not yet once had a single meeting with any of the members of the budget team in his first three years as governor, not one meeting. He does not want to have a conversation around the budget because he knows his numbers aren't real. The governor challenged us to a debate. He said he would debate anybody, any place, any time. He apparently meant anybody but us, anybody but me, and any place but New Jersey. The reality is he doesn't want to share a microphone. He wants an artificial state with paid cheerleaders that he has in this gallery today because he wants to stand up and speak half-truths. He doesn't want to have a conversation about what it takes to really solve the problem. The governor's attempt to throw $106 to the average taxpayer is like, as the governor says, let's go to the beach. You might as well be pouring a glass of water in the ocean and trying to fight back against the tide. The governor has asked for a number of things to solve property taxes. He said the toolkit would solve the problem. He got his toolkit. He said pension and health care would solve his problem. He got pension and health care. He said tenure reform would be the answer to property taxes in the state of New Jersey. He got tenure reform. The governor will move from 30-second soundbite to 30-second soundbite because he needs the media attention like you and I need oxygen in this room. And the reality is he does not have the patience or the discipline to meet with us about deep public policy reform to address a broken structural problem. Ladies and gentlemen, to offer the people of New Jersey what he has offered them in property tax relief after he has vetoed real and substantial relief for New Jersey's family is an insult to the families that we represent. The, the fact of the matter is that the, the small pittance that he offers them would not fill up their gas tank on the way to the Jersey Shore. It certainly wouldn't pay for a rental for a place down the shore. It wouldn't, it wouldn't pay for a hotel room stay for a night for them. Ladies and gentlemen, the reality is New Jersey's number one problem is property taxes. But the governor has already made his media buy. Some of you have seen the transcript. He already talks about how it's about an income tax cut. He cannot allow his personal ambition to step aside for a moment so that we can address the real problems in the state of New Jersey. Listen, I welcome him to a conversation. I welcome him to a debate. I think if he would join with us in an effort to solve this problem, he would see the same success that he got on tenure, that he got on pension and health, they go on higher ed reform, and that a budget that used his revenues. But the reality is this governor isn't sincere about solving these problems. Because when he, when he saw his first financial crisis, what did he do? He borrowed against the Transportation Trust Fund to pay for this. Many of you have written stories about the burden that New Jersey faces. And the reality is that the way the governor has paid for this tax cut, he can't afford it. The families will pay for the th next 30 years to pay for the tax cut that he proposes. The difference is the tax cut that we presented 
changes the disproportionate share of wealth in this state and requires middle class families who are struggling to receive the benefit while the rich have only gotten richer under this governor. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Do you plan to take any action today? No, we're not taking any action today. So there will be no vote on his conditional veto? There will be no vote on that conditional veto. Uh, today or in the future, that's dead. Uh, today or in the future. What do you think, uh, Madam Speaker, if you don't mind, when his point is that you guys, uh, you say his revenue estimates are unreal, you based your budget on that, you base your spending on that, but you won't base your tax cuts on that. The point this, you made this, is, this is the reference that the governor is making. Uh, in the budget that we submitted to the governor to support some of the spending items he made reference to, we identified to the administration pockets of revenue and appropriations that every single year you know are overfunded. Everyone knows that who has done any work on the budget in this state. We identified revenue to support the spending, the spending on the earned income tax credit, the spending on the mor uh, mortgage foreclosure uh, initiative, and a variety of other things. The governor knows that we must accept the certifications that he provides us with. He rejected our identification of revenues, but he stood here today and said he will accept the identification of those revenues and roll them into his own surplus. So the governor is now trying to purport to have a surplus of 600 some odd million dollars to now feather his case to provide this income tax cut. Uh, are you saying that you, the, you guys cannot pass a budget based on the OLS revenue projections you've had to embrace? The it? governor has to sign and certify the revenues. Even though OLS can provide us with projections, we are only, as the legislature, enabled to accept the certification that comes from the governor of the state. Tom, and if we were to cut, to the OLS revenues, all the governor would have done today is roll that $1.3 billion difference that Dr. Rosen had in the surplus again. And then that money would be there for the property tax cut that we've proposed. But it's fictionary. The money is not there until we know it's there. But even the plan that the governor proposed today, the, gov the plan that the governor accepted doesn't have to go into effect until April of next year. So, you know, again, this is theater. This is about an opportunity for him to stand on the grand stage. And let me make reference to that. You heard a lot of references, do it today, get this done before the week is over. April of 2013 is when the residents of this state will file their income taxes. And if legislation is worked through and enacted, it will have no effect on not one resident of this state until they file their taxes. And the reality is this is not an issue of emergent concern in terms of the enactment of legislation. If we agree upon revenue projections, if we see that revenue roll in, the legislature is more than prepared to put forth a piece of legislation to effectuate a tax reduction. And we are seeking a property tax reduction. Yes. Was it a uh, tactical mistake to send him the millionaire's tax that you knew he was going to veto because it just gave him the opportunity to then put it in this theater, as you call it, and, and conditionally veto it? And, I mean, in retrospect, did it make sense? No, no. I, I will never purport that sending the governor a bill that would raise a, a tax surcharge from 8.97 to 10.2 on anyone that earns a million dollars or more. It was not a tactical d detour on the part of Assembly Democrats. The residents of this state overwhelmingly expressed to this legislature that they believe those that earn one million or more are more positioned to carry a tax burden than they are, because disproportionately lower income families are carrying more of the burden. And what the residents of this state are looking for is for people to pay their fair share. Let me also point out to you, and we will provide you with information, what this budget did do 
This budget did reduce corporate business taxes. That's what this budget did. So we handed additional tax reductions to businesses in this state, but we gave nothing to low-income families or middle-class working families. And this legislature has worked repeatedly with each budget year to support reduction of taxes for businesses. It's time to flip the switch and provide some tax relief to average working families in this state. After the uh, governor's budget message was the state of the state address where both you and the Senate president stood together at this microphone, uh, this time you're separate. Uh, he's <clears throat> he's off in his office talking to the press. Uh, the governor has embraced basically his plan. Is it fair to deduce from that that the Assembly Democrats and the Senate Democrats are on different pages approaching the governor's call today? No, that, no, you should not deduce anything from the fact that the Senate president and the majority leader in the Senate are in another office talking to, to a press row and the Assembly is here. At the end of the day, the Assembly and the Senate will make determination collectively what direction they're going to go in. But there is no disparate, uh, you know, direction between our two bodies. Yes, the Assembly has a different point of view. Uh, the Senate never in initially went in the direction that we went in. But we believe all ideas are good ideas. And at the end, the, the majority in both houses will reach the same place. But there is no divide within the two houses. One more, Jenna. Uh, speaker, the governor has said that he was going to tour the state this summer saying that you guys are holding the tax on hostage, continue this kind of rhetoric. What will you do to combat that? What did the reporter do in Monmouth County on Saturday when he was called stupid and when he was called an idiot? I'm certain that that reporter ignored that. Members of this legislature will ignore name calling and, uh, quote, kicking of rear ends. Thanks.